Hi and welcome. This time around we're going to make some springs for to hold my parallels in place. Uh, this is some 17.7 stainless steel and it's in the A state right now which is annealed so it's extremely soft and malleable. Um, after you heat treat it uh, with a precipitation hardening heat treatment this turns into a very good spring and very hard material. So we're going to head over to the mill and we're going to convert uh, the, the, the die setup that I made for uh, making jaw protectors for my, uh, my other four jaw chuck before I got the new one. And we're going to take the, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of the punch side. I'm not sure what the top part would be. We're going to take the other side of this and we're going to mill a little cylindrical portion in it and mount some drill rod in there or some tool steel so that we can have a uh, press that will... Uh, press things, uh, make them round, which is what I'm looking for. Uh, so basically I'm going to try and curve the ends and then have a big dimple in the middle. And we're just going to see if we can make springs that'll work. This is more of an experiment than anything. Hope you find it interesting. Let's head over to the mill. So we have the, uh, the punch side of the punch and die set. I'm not sure if you'd really call that it because it's sort of a forming die, but, uh, we have the bottom part here. And I case hardened this on a past uh, episode. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a carbide end mill and I'm going to remove, I'm going to go down like ten thousandths and remove all the case hardening so that I can take this ball mill and uh, cut a nice uh, round groove down the center where I can uh, silver solder in or uh, TIG weld in a piece of tool steel that I'll use as a round bending element. So uh, let me get that set up. All right, we're going to take a simple 10,000 pass. And just for safety's sake, I think we're going to go down another 10,000. I doubt the uh, case hardening went super deep, but... Uh, Let's uh, just make sure. You can tell it's pretty hard. Look at those little tiny blue uh, curly cues coming off of here. We have the ball nose end mill loaded here, and I'm going to try a 25,000 depth of cut. This is high speed steel, so I've got to go much slower than I normally do. And uh, we'll just see how it works. Uh, I don't know how sharp this is. I got this in a state sale, so it's used. So we will just give it a shot. Twenty-five thousand depth of cut. Sounds like maybe too fast to feed. It's not sharp or it's too hard for it. Maybe what I should do is start with a carbide end mill, cut out most of the material and use the ball mill to finish it off. That might be the good idea here. Now that a good chunk of material is removed, we're going to try and remove just the uh, round portion very slowly. Another thing I've read says case hardening doesn't actually go that deep, but it kind of looks like uh, it might have because I took 50 thousandths off the top, so I should be plenty deep, but it just chowdered this uh, cutter. If this material isn't still hard deep down, uh, 50 thousandths down from the surface, uh, I don't know why this would be killed because for a 3 8 inch diameter cutter, 
we were looking at an RPM between 500 and 2000 and I started at 240 and it was doing this and I thought oh maybe I'm going too slow but look at that it just chowdered it so we're going to try and give Brazen a shot here I'm trying brazing because I've done almost none of it. Interesting that the brazing completely failed and uh, TIG really completely failed. I had to lay down a bead, grind it off, lay down a bead, grind it off like five times before I could get it to stick and I couldn't figure out what's going on. Every time I put some uh, filler material down here, it started bubbling like crazy and ended up massively porous. There's still even a little bit of uh, that porosity there. It was really hard to get a clean bead on this and this isn't really great. Here's an interesting thing. I think I know why. See this coloration here? It was all over the place. I think that is the uh, case hardening material that I used to case harden this the first time coming out of solution. And uh, it covered my welding table with this fine red mist, or this is sort of orangish yellow here. It's kind of interesting. And you'll see how bubbly and porous this is. That was after several tries on this too. It's amazing. Uh, if someone out there knows more about this, I tried to search online and I don't think you can weld over cherry red directly. I think you have to remove all that material before you can lay down a bead. Uh, if anyone knows, I'd love to hear from you. So we're going to take this guy and use this as the other side. Um, I don't know that it's going to work right, but uh, it is shaped like a V, which I want. So we're going to give it a shot and see if this will work fine as a die to press the plate into. So first I'm going to just skim off the top and remove some of these test beads. So you can see all the porosity here after I've taken down the weld beads in the top. I'm taking 25 thousandths depth of cut here. And you can see all the bubbling that went on in there. As soon as I laid the belt weld bead down, as soon as it puddled, the metal melted, the base metal, it started bubbling like crazy. And you put in the filler metal and that would bubble like crazy. Uh, so again, if anyone knows uh, if you can weld cherry red, maybe I did something wrong. Um, it seems like you can't that the stuff that uh, does the case hardening dissolves into the metal and will come out pretty readily when heated. Uh, again, please let me know if you know. I'd love to learn more and maybe other people could benefit. Thanks. So this turned out to be too wide. It sort of works, but uh, I've got this aluminum uh, uh, angle block that uh, I built during my time in uh, machine school. And it was one of the first projects I did and uh, it turns out that the forces here are so low that I can easily make these things uh, inside an aluminum block with, without it deforming. The beauty is it can't catastrophically fail because it's soft, it'll deform first. So, there's the first curved side. Unfortunately, this thing seeks its own, uh, own center. Okay, and now we need to bend this in the middle, which I have provided a center line for. So I didn't need the other part at all. So here's what you've got. This is a pretty tight spring, but you want to see how easy to bend it is? That's with my hand. This is a pretty thick gauge too. So right now it's not very springy at all, but after we heat treat it, it's gonna be. So I'm gonna make a few more of these in different different bends and different dimensions just to see uh, if it'll work out for me and uh, I'll bring you back. As a side note, without the air jack attachment, the air motor attachment on the jack, 
this would have taken forever because I would have had to hand crank every one of these uh, in. Instead, just uh, used the compressor and took a tiny fraction of the time. All right, we're just about ready to go. We're going to pop these in the heat treat. So first stage is ramp up to 1400 degrees, hold for about 15 minutes, and then we will take this out and we will cool it off with air, air cool it. Then we take the uh, kiln, let it cool down to 1050, and we let them soak for an hour, and that's when the uh, precipitation hardening takes, takes effect. So, all we are going to do is uh, go to ramp hold, user 1, and enter. And then we are going to stop. I could review it, but I know it's right. So then we will start, and now we're ready to go. Next step, I'm going to pull the hot parts out of the kiln and we're going to air cool them down. They're in a metal tray. The metal tray will sit in the water, which will cool the metal tray down faster. I've got an air compressor to cool these parts off. I will be back. All right, so the parts are going to go in for the second part of the hardening process which unlike normal metals like tool steels that are that are tempered where you're trying to lock a crystal structure in place this 177 stainless wants to be precipitation hard this hardened so what you do is you heat it up to a temperature where the carbides and some other uh, metals I think copper is one of them precipitate out of solution into little nodules and that's what gives it its strength and resiliency Notice the change in color of the parts. Lukewarm to the touch. Very good. Supposed to let them cool to room temperature. All right, so here are the parts after hardening. And uh, before, when I bent this one, it just stayed bent, whatever shape I put it in. Now it's got a lot more spring to it. Noticeable difference. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this over to the grinder and I'm going to round off these points. I'm going to pop it in the tumbler just to clean off all the mill scale and uh, see what happens. The parts are heading on into the vibratory tumbler for a couple of hours and uh, we'll come back out and see how they look. Here are the springs and uh, they definitely feel like they're uh, much more rigid and a lot less flexible. They don't feel at all like they... Uh, are holding the bend uh, like they did this one in particular so we will give that a test though um, I made this extra piece for another project I was working on and uh, I also threw another piece in when I was hardening it so that I could have a test strip so here is uh, 177 in the annealed state right here and 177 in the precipitation hardened state provided I did it right I'm not sure there's a multiple things that could have gone wrong in doing this one is uh, the temperature is very critical and I used a kiln and I'm not sure how accurate the kiln temperature is how accurate it holds the temperature uh, number two the quenching when you're air quenching you need huge volumes of air I used my air compressor but I'm not sure if that was enough finally I bought my 177 like this uh, off of eBay it came with like 20 pieces this size and I thought oh they'd be great for making springs and things that'd be really handy except I have no idea if this really is 177 uh, I just trusted the vendor that was selling it I wrote the 177 on there so uh, next up let's uh, quickly test these two pieces and I'm going to bend them both equally and see if uh, they hold their shape but you can tell this one I mean it never tries to pop back at all so we're going to bend them both simultaneously by putting them in the vise all right so let's try the quick test so both pieces of 177 are in the vise the, the more silvery one is in the supposed annealed state and the one on the left is supposedly precipitation hardened by myself so let's start with a mild bend and bend it like that and you will notice that the annealed one did not pop back at all right Let's try a more significant bend. And again, the precipitation hard one bounces back. The annealed one continues to deform very easily. All 
Okay. The precipitation hard one finally exceeded its uh, yield strength there and is now starting to bend, but the annealed one continues to deform very easily. And again. So I don't know quite how much the uh, precipitation hardened, uh, how much stronger or springiness uh, it's supposed to be, but it definitely is more than the annealed state. So whatever I did, I did a better job than um, it would have been if I had just uh, left it in the annealed state, because the annealed state doesn't tend to spring back much at all. Yeah. So significant difference. So let's test them as springs. Let's head over to the mill and see how they perform over there. All right, so here are my parallels. I mean, uh, my springs for my parallels that I made. And uh, I'll show you how they work. So you can uh, pop them in the vise. And you can see, placing them this way, that the curved part here, the reason why I curved the ends up, is as you squeeze these tighter, it pushes the ends out and they need to slide. And uh, this way, they won't damage the parallels. They'll just uh, slide smoothly. So here they are in place, and they're holding the parallels very tightly. And uh, they pop right back. So I made them in various sizes. I think if I'd thought more about it, I would have made a couple more interim sizes, but we can always do that again. Um, this one, which was also an experiment, to see if I needed even more force, this one's ridiculous. And I almost need the big handle on the Kurt vise to put any pressure. You can feel the parallels now, it can't move at all. This was a fun experiment, but uh, probably not terribly useful. Anyways, these are the parts I made, and it was more an experiment to see if I could precipitation harden 17.7, and I think the answer is I can. I don't know how well I did. I'm not quite sure how springy it should have been, but they tend to work pretty well. So. Anyways, I consider it a success. Thanks for watching. I hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time.